Hey crew, it's Pitt, and I'm back with some more freedom. Today we're going to be continuing our energetic investment in our union by talking about the Federalist Papers. We're going to be doing Federalist 41, 42, and 43 today, talking about the general view of the powers conferred by the Constitution. I believe that me reading this aloud, and you listening to it, or reading it aloud yourself, invest our energy into our union. And the more that we know, the more ed education and entertainment involved in education that we can possibly get out there that involves this the better off we all will be and so if you do watch i appreciate it but it's mostly just going to be me reading with very little interruption so i also understand if you don't want to hang around for that we're going to be dealing with federalist number 41 because we finished up federalist number 40 yesterday and this is the general view of the powers conferred by the constitution <clears throat> for the, for the independent journal authored by James Madison to the people of the state of New York. The Constitution proposed by the Convention may be considered under two general points of view. The first relates to the sum or quantity of power which it vests in the government, including the restraints imposed on the states. The second to the particular structure of the government and the distribution of this power among its several branches. Under the first view of the subject, two important questions arise whether any part of the powers transferred to the general government be unnecessary or improper, whether the entire mass of them be dangerous to the portion of jurisdiction left in the several states. Is the aggregate power of the general government greater than it ought, than ought to have been vested in it? This is the first question. It cannot have escaped those who have attended with candor to the arguments employed against the extensive powers of the government, that the authors of them have very little considered how far these powers were necessary means of attaining a necessary end. They have chosen, rather, to dwell on the inconveniences which must be unavoidably blended with all political advantages on the possible abuses which must be incident to every power of trust, of which a beneficial use can be made. This method of handling the subject cannot impose on the good sense of the people of America. It may display the subtlety of the writer. It may open a boundless field for rhetoric and declamation. It may inflame the passions of the unthinking and may confirm the prejudices of the misthinking. But cool and candid people will at once reflect <clears throat> that the purest of human blessings must have a portion of alloy in them, that the choice must always be made, if not of the lesser evil, at least of the greater, not the perfect good, and that in every political institution a power to advance the public happiness involves a discretion which may be misapplied and abused. They will see, therefore, that in all cases where power is to be conferred, the, first, the point first to be decided is whether such power will be necessary to the public good, and the next will be, in case of an affirmative decision, to guard as effectually as possible against a perversion of the power to the public detriment. That we may form a correct judgment on this subject, it will be proper to review the several powers conferred on the government of the Union, and that this may be more conveniently done, they may be reduced into different classes as they relate to the following subjects. Objects. Security against foreign danger. Regulation of the intercourse with foreign nations. Maintenance of harmony and proper intercourse among the states. Certain miscellaneous objects of general utility. Restraint of the states from certain injurious acts provisions for giving due efficiency to all these powers. The powers falling within the first class are those of declaring war and granting letters of mark, of providing armies and fleets, of regulating and calling forth the militia, of levying and borrowing money. Security against foreign danger is one of the primitive objects of civil society. <clears throat> it is an avowed and essential object of the American Union. <clears throat> the powers requisite for attaining it must be effectually confided in the federal councils. Is the power of declaring war necessary? 
No man will answer this question in the negative. It would be superfluous, therefore, to enter into a proof of the affirmative. The existing confederation establishes this power in the most ample form. Is the power of raising armies and equipping fleets necessary? This is involved in the foregoing power. It is involved in the power of self-defense. But was it necessary to give an indefinite power of raising troops as well as providing fleets and of maintaining both in peace as well as in war? The answer to these questions has been too far anticipated in another place to admit an extensive discussion of them in this place. The answer indeed seems to be so obvious and conclusive as scarcely to justify such a discussion in any place. With what color of propriety could the force necessary for defense be limited by those who cannot limit the force of, of offense? If a federal constitution could chain the ambition or set bounds to the exertions of all other nations, then indeed might it prudently chain the discretion of its own government and set bounds to the exertions for its own safety. How could a readiness for war in time of peace be safely prohibited, unless we could prohibit it in like manner the preparations and establishments of every hostile nation? The means of security can only be regulated by the means and the danger of attack. They will, in fact, be ever determined by these rules and by no others. It is in vain to oppose constitutional barriers to the impulse of self-preservation. It is worse than in vain because it plants in the Constitution itself unnecessary unnecess usurpations of power. Every precedent of which is a germ of unnecessary and multiplied repetitions. If one nation maintains constantly a disciplined army, ready for the service of ambition or revenge, it obliges the most pacific nations who may be within reach of its enterprises to take corresponding precautions. The 15th century was the unhappy epoch of military establishments in the time of peace. They were introduced by Charles VII of France. All Europe has followed or been forced into the example. Had the example not been followed by other nations, all Europe must long ago have worn the chains of a universal monarch. Were every nation except France now to disband its peace establishments, the same event might follow. The veteran legions of Rome were an overmatch for the undisciplined valor of all other nations and rendered her the mistress of the world. Not the less true is it that the liberties of Rome proved the final victim to her military triumphs and that the liberties of Europe, as far as they ever existed, have, with few exceptions, been the price of her military establishments. A standing force, therefore, is a dangerous, at the same time that it may be a necessary provision. On the smallest scale, it has its inconveniences. On an extensive scale, its consequences may be fatal. On any scale, it is an object of laudable circumspection and precaution. A wise nation will combine all these considerations and, whilst it does not rashly preclude itself from any resource which may become essential to its safety, will exert all its prudence in diminishing both the necessity and the danger of resorting to one which may be inauspicious to its liberties. The clearest marks of this prudence are stamped on the proposed constitution. The Union itself, which it cements and secures, destroys every pretext for a military establishment which could be dangerous. America, united, with a handful of troops or without a single soldier, exhibits a more forbidding posture to foreign ambition than America disunited, with a hundred thousand veterans ready for combat. It was remarked on a foreign, former occasion that the want of this pretext had saved the liberties of one nation in Europe. Being rendered by her insular situation and her maritime resources impregnable to the armies of her neighbors, the rulers of Great Britain have never been able, by real or artificial dangers, to cheat the public into an extensive peace establishment. The distance of the United States from the powerful nations of the world gives them the same happy security. A dangerous establishment can never be necessary or plausible so long as they continue a united people. But let it never, for a moment, be forget forgotten that they are indebted for this advantage to the Union alone. The moment of its dissolution will be the date of a new order of things. 
the fears of the weaker or the ambition of the stronger states or confederacies will set the same example as the new in the new as charles the seventh did in the old world the example will be followed here from the same motives which produced universal imitation there instead of deriving from our situation the precious advantage which great britain has derived from hers the face of america will be but a copy of that of the continent of europe it will present liberty everywhere crushed between standing armies and perpetual taxes the fortunes of disunited america will be even more disastrous than those of europe the sources of evil in the latter are confined to her own limits no superior powers of another quarter of the globe intrigue among her rival nations inflame their mutual animosities and render them the instruments of foreign ambition jealousy and revenge in america the misery springing from her internal jealousies contentions and wars would form only a part of her lot a plentiful addition of evils would have their source in that relation in which europe stands to this quarter of the earth and which no other quarter of the earth bears to europe this picture of the consequences of disunion cannot be too highly colored or too often exhibited every man who loves peace every man who loves his country every man who loves liberty ought to have it ever before his eyes that he may cherish in his heart a due attachment to the union of america and be able to set a due value on the means of preserving it next to the effectual establishment of the union the best possible precaution against danger from standing armies is a limitation on the of the term for which revenue may be apportioned for their support this precaution the constitution has prudently added i will not repeat here the observations which i flatter myself have placed this subject in a just and satisfactory light but it may not be improper to take notice of an argument against this part of the constitution which has been drawn from the policy and practice of great britain it is said that the continuance of an army in that kingdom requires an annual vote of the legislature whereas the american constitution has lengthened this critical period to two years this is the form in which the comparison is usually stated to the public but is it a just form is it a fair comparison does the british constitution re restrain the parliamentary discretion to one year does the american impose on congress appropriations for two years on the contrary, it cannot be unknown to the authors of the fallacy themselves that the British Constitution fixes no limit whatsoever to the discretion of the legislature, and that the American ties the legislature to two years as the longest admissible term. Had the argument from the British example been truly stated, it would have stood thus. The term for which supplies may be appropriated to the army establishment, though unlimited by the British Constitution, has nevertheless in practice been limited to a parliamentary discretion of a single year <clears throat> now if in great britain where the house of commons is elected for seven years where so great a proportion of the members are elected by so small a proportion of the people where the electors are so corrupted by the representatives and the representatives so corrupted by the crown the representative body can possess a power to make appropriations to the army for an indefinite term without desiring or without daring to extend the term beyond a single year ought not suspicion herself to blush and pretending that the representatives of the united states elected freely by the whole body of the people every second year cannot be safely entrusted with the discretion over such appropriations expressly limited to the short period of two years a bad cause seldom fails to betray itself of this truth the management of the opposition to the federal government is an unvaried exemplification but among all the blunders which have been committed none is more striking than the attempt to enlist on that side the prudent jealousy entertained by the people of standing armies the attempt has awakened fully the public attention to that important subject and has led to investigations which must terminate in a thorough and universal conviction not only that the constitution has provided the most effectual guards against danger from that quarter but that nothing short of a constitution fully adequate to the national defense and the preservation of the union can save america from as many standing armies as it may be split into states or confederacies 
and from such a progressive augmentation of these establishments in each as will render them as burdensome to the properties as and ominous to the liberties of the people as any establishment that can become necessary under a united and efficient government must be tolerable to the former and safe to the latter. The palpable necessity of the power to provide and maintain a navy has protected that part of the Constitution against the spirit of censure, which has spared few other parts. It must, indeed, be numbered among the greatest blessings of America that, as her union will be the only source of her maritime strength, so this will be a principal source of her security against danger from abroad. In this respect, our situation bears another likeness to the insular advantage of Great Britain. The batteries most capable of repelling foreign enterprise on our safety are happily such as can never be turned by a perfidious government against our liberties. The inhabitants of the Atlantic frontier are, all of them, deeply interested in the provision for naval protection, and if they have hitherto been suffered to sleep quietly in their beds, if their property has remained safe against the predatory spirit of licentious adventures, if their maritime towns have not yet been compelled to ransom themselves from the terrors of a conflagration by yielding to the exactions of daring and sudden invaders, these instances of good fortune are not to be ascribed to the capacity of the existing government for the protection of those from whom it claims allegiance. But it causes but to causes that are fugitive and fallacious. If we expect, except perhaps Virginia and Maryland, which are peculiarly, peculiarly vulnerable to their eastern frontiers, no part of the Union ought to feel more anxiety on this subject than New York. Her sea coast is extensive. A very important district of the state is an island. The state itself is penetrated by a large navigable river for more than 50 leagues. The great emporium of its commerce, the great reservoir of its wealth, lies every moment at the mercy of events and may almost be regarded as a hostage for ignominious compliances with the dictates of a foreign enemy or even with the rapacious demands of pirates and barbarians. Should a war be the result of our precarious situation of European affairs and all the unruly passions attending to it be let loose on the ocean, our escape from insults and depredations, not only on that element but every part of the other boarding ring on it, will be truly miraculous. In the present condition of America, the states who are more immediately exposed to these calamities have nothing to hope from the phantom of a general government which now exists and if their single resources were equal to the task of fortifying themselves against the danger the object to be protected would be almost consumed by the means of protecting them the power of regulating and calling forth the militia has already been sufficiently vindicated and explained the power of levying and borrowing money being the sinew of that which is to be exerted in the national defense <clears throat> is properly thrown into the same class with it. This power, also, has been examined already with much attention and has, I trust, been clearly shown to be necessary, both in the extent and form given to it by the Constitution. I will address one additional reflection only to those who contend that the power ought to have been restrained by to external taxation, by which they mean taxes on articles imported from other countries. It cannot be doubted that this will always be a valuable source of revenue, that for a considerable time it must be a principal source, that at this moment it is an essential one. But we may form very mistaken ideas on this subject. If we do not call to mind in our calculations that the extent of revenue drawn from a foreign commerce must vary with the variations, both in the extent and kind of imports, and that these variations do not correspond with the progress of population, which must be the general measure of the public wants. As long as agriculture continues the sole field of labor, the importation of manufacturers must increase as the consumers multiply. As soon as the domestic manufacturers are begun by the hands not called for agriculture, the imported manufacturers will decrease as the numbers of people increase. In a more remote stage, the imports may consist in a considerable part of raw materials, which will be wrought into articles for exportation and will, 
therefore, require rather an encouragement of bounties than to be loaded with discouraging duties. A system of government meant for duration ought to contemplate these revolutions and be able to accommodate itself to them. Some who have not denied the necessity of the power of taxation have grounded a very fierce attack against the Constitution on the language in which it is defined. It has been urged and echoed that the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States amounts to an unlimited commission to exercise every power which may be alleged to be necessary for the common defense or general welfare. No stronger proof could be given of the distress under which these writers labor for objections than their stooping to such a misconstruction. Had no other enumeration or definition of the powers of the Congress been found in the Constitution, then the general expressions just cited, the authors of the objection might have had some color for it, though it would have been difficult to find a reason for so awkward a form of describing an authority to legislate in all possible cases. <clears throat> a power to destroy the freedom of the press, the trial by jury, or even to regulate the course of dissent, or the forms of conveyances must be very singularly expressed by the terms to raise money for the general welfare. But what color can the objection have when a specification of the objects alluded to by the general terms immediately follows and is not even separated by a longer pause than a semicolon? If the different parts of the same instrument ought to be so expounded as to give meaning to every part which it will bear, shall one part of the same sentence be excluded altogether from a share in the meaning? And shall the more doubtful and indefinite terms be retained for their full extent, and the clear and precise expressions be denied for any signification whatsoever? For what purpose could the enumeration of particular powers be inserted, if these and all others were meant to be included in the preceding general power? Nothing is more natural nor common than first to use a general phrase and then to explain and qualify it by a recital of particulars. But the idea of an enumeration of particulars which neither explain nor qualify the general meaning and can have no other effect than to confound and mislead is an absurdity, which, as we are reduced to the dilemma of charging either on the authors of the objection or on the authors of the Constitution, we must take the liberty of supposing, had not its origin with the latter. The objection here is more extraordinary, as it appears that the language used by the Convention is a copy from the Articles of Confederation. The objects of the Union among the states, as described in Article Third, are their common defense, security of their liberties, and mutual and general welfare. The terms of the Article Eighth are still more identical all charges of war and all other expenses that shall be incurred for the common defense or general welfare and allowed by the United States in Congress shall be defrayed out of a common treasury, etc. A similar language occurs again in the Article 9th. Construe either of these articles by the rules which would, which would justify the construction put on the new Constitution and they vest in the existing Congress a power to legislate in all cases whatsoever. But what would have been thought of in that assembly if attaching themselves to these general expressions and disregarding the specifications which ascertain and limit their import? They had exercised an unlimited power of providing for the common defense and general welfare. I appeal to the objectors themselves whether they would in that case have employed the same reasoning and justification of Congress as they now make use of against the Convention. How difficult is it for error to escape its own condemnation? And so ends Federalist Paper Number 41. And here we are getting the arguments against laid out fairly well, but for the most part they are groundless, right? They are things that are addressed in the Constitution and it is, well, you didn't make this example clear enough, or you didn't define this point clear enough. And sometimes it's not necessarily to get too detailed, because you need to have the latitude to be able to adjust to whatever the situation might be. And that is 
fairly well outlined here. I don't have a whole lot to add, but now we're going to get into Federalist number 42. This is the powers conferred by the Constitution further considered from the New York packet today, Tuesday, January the 22nd of 1788, authored by James Madison to the people of the state of New York. <clears throat> the second class of powers lodged in the general government consists of those which regulate the intercourse with foreign nations, to wit, to make treaties, to send and receive ambassadors, other public ministers, and consuls, to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations, to regulate foreign commerce, including the power to prohibit, after the year 1808, the importation of slaves, and to lay an intermediate duty of $10 per head, as a discouragement to such importations. This class of powers forms an obvious and essential branch of the federal administration. If we are to be one nation in any respect, it clearly ought to be in respect to other nations. The powers to make treaties and send and receive ambassadors speak their own propriety. Both of them are comprised in the Articles of Confederation, with this difference only that the former is disembarrassed by the plans of the convention of an exception, under which treaties might be substantially frustrated by regulations of the states, and that a power of appointing and receiving other public ministers and consuls is expressly and very properly added to the form former provision concerning ambassadors. The term ambassador, if taken strictly, as seems to be required by the second of the Articles of the Confederation, comprehends the highest grade only of public ministers, and excludes the grades which the United States will be most likely to prefer, where foreign embassies may be necessary. And under no latitude of construction will the terms comprehend consul consuls. Yet it has been found expedient, and has been the practice of Congress, to employ the inferior grades of public ministers, and to send and receive consuls. It is true that where treaties of commerce stipulate for the mutual appointment of consuls, whose functions are connected with commerce, the admission of foreign consuls may fall within the power of making commercial treaties, and that where no such treaties exist, the mission of American consuls into foreign countries may, perhaps, be covered under the authority given by the Ninth Article of the Confederation, to appoint all such civil officers as may be necessary for managing the general affairs of the United States. But the admission of consuls into the United States, where no previous treaty has stipulated it, seems to have been nowhere provided for. A supply of the admission of one of the lesser instances in which the Convention have improved on the model before them, but the most minute provisions become important when they tend to obviate the necessity or the pretext for gradual and unobserved usurpations of power. A list of the cases in which Congress have been betrayed or forced by the defects of the Confederation into violations of their chartered authorities would not a little surprise those who have paid no attention to the subject and would be no inconsiderable argument in favor of the new con Constitution which seems to have been provided no less studiously for the lesser than the more obvious and striking defects of, defects of the old. The power to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the laws of nations belongs with equal propriety to the general government and is a still greater improvement on the Articles of Confederation. These articles contain no provision for the case of offenses against the law of nations and consequently leave it in the power of any indiscreet member to embroil the confederacy with foreign nations. The provision of the federal articles on these subjects of piracies and felonies extend no further than to the establishment of courts for the trial of these offenses. The definition of piracies might, perhaps, without inconveniency, be left to the law of nations though a legislative definition of them is found in most municipal codes. A definition of felonies on the high seas is evidently requisite. Felony is a term of loose signification, even in the common law of England, and of various import in the statutory law, law of that kingdom. But neither the common nor the statute law of that or any other nation ought to be a standard for the proceedings of this 
unless previously made by its own, its own by legislative adoption. The meaning of the term, as defined in the codes of the several states, would be as impractical, impracticable as the former would be a dishonorable and illegitimate guide. It is not precisely the same in any two of the states and varies in each with each every revision of its criminal laws. For the sake of certainty and uniformity, therefore, the power of defining felonies in this case was in every respect necessary and proper. The regulation of foreign commerce, having fallen within several views which have been taken of this subject, have been too fully discussed to need additional proofs here of its being properly submitted to the federal administration. It were doubtless to be wished that the power of prohibiting the importation of slaves had not been postponed until the year 1808, or rather that it had been suffered to have immediate operation. But it is not difficult to account either for this restriction on the general government or for the manner in which the whole clause is expressed. It ought to be considered as a great point gained in favor of humanity that a period of twenty years may terminate forever within these states a traffic which has so long and so loudly abraded the barbarism of modern policy that within that period it will receive a considerable discouragement from the federal government and may be totally abolished by a concurrence of the few states which continue the unnatural traffic and the prohibitory example which has been given by so great a majority of the Union. Happy would it be for the unfortunate Africans if an equal prospect lay before them of being redeemed from the oppressions of their European brethren. Attempts have been made to pervert this clause into an objection against the Constitution by representing it on one side as a criminal toleration of an illicit practice and on another as calculated to prevent voluntary and beneficial immigrations from Europe to America. I mention these misconstructions, not with a view to give them an answer, for they deserve none, but as specimens of the manner and spirit in which some have thought fit to conduct their opposition to the proposed government. The powers included in the third class are those which provide for the harmony and proper intercourse among the states. Under this head might be included the particular restraints imposed on the authority of the states and certain powers of the judicial department, but the former are reserved for a distinct class, and the latter will be particularly examined when we arrive at the structure and organization of the government. I shall confine myself to a cursory review of the remaining powers comprehended under this third description. To wit, to regulate commerce among the several states and the Indian tribes, to coin money, regulate the value thereof and of foreign coin, to provide for the punishment of counterfeiting the current coin and securities of the United States, to fix the standard of weights and measures, to establish a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws of bankruptcy, to prescribe the manner in which the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of each state shall be proved, and the effect they shall have in other states, and to establish post offices and post roads. The defect of power in the existing confederacy to regulate the commerce between its several members is in the number of those who have been clearly pointed out by experience. To the proofs and remarks which former papers have brought into view of this subject, it may be added that without this supplemental provision, the great and essential power of regulating foreign commerce would have been incomplete and in fact ineffectual. A very material object of this power was the relief of the states which import and export through other states from the improper contributions levied on them by the latter. Were these at liberty to regulate the trade between state and state, it must be foreseen that ways would be found out to load the articles of import and export during the passage through their jurisdiction with duties which would fall on the makers of the latter and the consumers of the former. We may be assured by past experience that such a practice would be introduced by future contrivances, and both by that and a common knowledge of human affairs that it would nourish unceasing animosities, and not improbably terminate in serious interruptions of the public tranquility. To those who do not view the question through the medium of passion or interest, the desire of the commercial states to collect 
in any form an indirect revenue from their uncommercial neighbors must appear not less impolitic than it is unfair, since it would stimulate the injured party by resentment as well as interest to resort to less convenient channels for their foreign trade. But the mild voice of reason, pleading the cause of an enlarged and permanent interest, is but too often drowned before public bodies as well as individuals by the clamors of an impatient avidity for immediate and immoderate gain. The necessity of a superintending authority over the reciprocal trade of the Confederated States has been illustrated by other examples as well as our own. In Switzerland, where the union is so very slight, each canton is obliged to allow the merchandises to pass through its jurisdiction into other cantons without an augmentation of the tolls. <clears throat> In Germany, it is the law of the empire that the princes and states shall not lay tolls or customs on bridges, rivers, or passages without the consent of the emperor and the diet, though it appears from a quotation in an antecedent patent paper that the practice in this, as in many other instances of the confederacy, has not followed the law and has produced there the mischiefs which have been foreseen here. Among the restraints imposed by the Union of the Netherlands on its members, one is that they shall not establish imposts of disadvantageous to their neighbors without the general permission. The regulation of commerce with the Indian tribes is very properly unfettered from two limitations in the Articles of Confederation, which render the provision obscure and contradictory. The power is there restrained to Indians, not members of any of the states, and is not to violate or infringe the legislative right of any state within its own limits. What description of Indians are to be deemed members of a state is not yet settled and has been a question of frequent perplexity and contention in the federal councils, and how the trade with Indians, though not members of a state, yet residing within its leg legislative jurisdiction, can be regulated by an external authority without so far intruding on the internal rights of legislation is absolutely incomprehensible. This is not this is not the only case in which the Articles of Confederation have inconsiderately endeavored to accomplish impossibilities. To reconcile a partial sovereignty in the Union with complete sovereignty in the states, to subvert a mathematical axiom by taking away a part and letting the whole remain. All that needs to be remarked on the power to coin money, regulate the value thereof, and a foreign coin is that by providing for this last case, the Constitution has supplied a material admission in the Articles of Confederation. The authority of the existing Congress is restrained to the regulation of coins struck by their own authority, or that of the respective states. It must be seen at once that the proposed uniformity in the value of the current coin might be destroyed by subjecting that of foreign coin to the different regulations of the different states. The punishment of counterfeiting the public securities, as well as the current coin, is, trans is submitted, of course, to that authority which is to secure the value of both. The regulation of weights and measures is transferred from the Articles of Confederation and is founded on like considerations with the preceding power of regulating coin. The dissimilarity in the rules of naturalization has long been remarked as a fault in our system and as laying a foundation for intricate and delicate questions. In the fourth article of the Confederation, it is declared that the free inhabitants of each of these states, paupers, vagabonds, and fugitives from justice accepted, shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of free citizens in the several states. And the people of each state shall, in every other, enjoy all the privileges of trade and commerce, etc. There is a confusion of language here which is remarkable. While the terms free inhabitants are used in one part of the article and free citizens in another and people in another, or what was meant by superadding to all privileges and immunities of free citizens, all the privileges of trade and commerce cannot easily be determined. It seems to be a construction scarcely avoidable, however, that those who come under the denomination of free inhabitants of a state, although not citizens of such state, are entitled in every other state 
to all the privileges of free citizens in the latter. That is, to greater privileges than they may be entitled to in their own state. So that it may be in the power of a particular state, or rather, every state is laid under a necessity not only to confer the rights of citizenship in other states upon any whom it may admit to such rights within itself, but upon any whom it may allow to become inhabitants within its jurisdiction. But were an exposition of the term inhabitants to be admitted, which would confine the stipulated privileges to citizens alone, the difficulty is diminished only, not removed. The very improper power would still be retained by each state of naturalizing aliens in every other state. In one state, residence for a short term confirms all the rights of citizenship. In another, qualifications of greater importance are required. An alien, therefore, legally incapacitated for certain rights in the latter, may, by previous residence only in the former, elude his incapacity, and thus the law of one state be preposterously rendered paramount to the law of another within the jurisdiction of the other. We owe it to mere casualty that very serious embarrassments on this subject have been hitherto escaped. By the laws of several states, certain descriptions of aliens who had rendered themselves obnoxious were laid under interdicts, inconsistent not only with the rights of citizenship, but with the privilege of residence. What would have been the consequence if such persons, by residence or otherwise, had acquired the character of citizens under the laws of another state, and then asserted their rights as such, both to residence and citizenship, within the state prescribing them. Whatever the legal consequences might have been, other consequences would probably have resulted, of too serious a nature to be provided against. The new Constitution has, accordingly, with great propriety, made provision against them, and all others proceeding from the defect of the Confederation on this head, by authorizing the general government to establish a uniform rule of naturalization throughout the United States. The power of establishing uniform laws of bankruptcy is so intimately connected with the regulation of commerce and will prevent so many frauds where the parties or their property may lie or be removed into different states that the expediency of it seems not likely to be drawn into question. The power of prescribing by general laws the manner in which the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of each state shall be proved, and the effect they have in other states is an evident and valuable improvement on the clause relating to this subject in the Articles of Confederation. The meaning of the latter is extremely indeterminate and can be of little importance under any interpretation which it will bear. The power here is established may be rendered a very convenient instrument of justice and be particularly beneficial to the borders of a contiguous states where the effects liable to justice may be suddenly and secretly translated in any stage of the process within a foreign jurisdiction. The power of establishing post roads must in every view be a harmless power and may, perhaps, by judicious management, become productive to of great public conveniency. Nothing which tends to facilitate the intercourse between the states can be deemed unworthy of the public care. And so ends Federalist number 42. And here we get a very good look at the intentions of the framers as to freedom. There was, at the time, the African slave trade going on, but it was very much not accepted all over the place. There were, indeed, abolitionists in the time of writing the Constitution. It was not, it was not intended to be oppressive to anyone. There were exceptions made for the, the Indians, right? Because they were a separate nation, and it was conquest. I don't shy away from that. It was conquest. This land was conquered. That is what happened. That is the history of humanity. But even then, they were recognizing the fact that <clears throat> the slave trade was an unnatural practice, right? The taking of people for generations of slavery was absolutely horrid. And it was only due to great need for the alliance that it was even admitted. 
And then it was given a time limit. You couldn't bring in any new slaves after the time limit was up. And it was only 20 minute, 20 years away. That is not long in the scope of history. So the, the effect of wanting freedom is very much demonstrated here. And even, even trying to keep the Indian nations sovereign was evident here, right? They were trying to accommodate the fact that they had already taken this land, but keep the Indians as sovereign peoples. That did not really work out in the long run, but it was the intention of the framers, and we get that right here. Now, we're not going to get into the excises and taxes. We have covered that plenty. We're not going to get into some of these other things, but it is important to note that even while framing the Constitution, even while debating whether to have the Constitution, there were still people very much invested in not having slavery be a thing. Federalist Paper Number 43, the same subject continued, the powers conferred by the Constitution further considered. For the Independent Journal by James Madison to the people of the state of New York. The fourth class comprises the following miscellaneous powers. 1. A power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing, for a limited time, to authors and inventors the exclusive right of their respective writings and discoveries. The utility of this power will scarcely be questioned. The copyright of authors has been solemnly adjudged in Great Britain to be a right of common law. The right to use, uh, the right to useful inventions seems with equal reason to belong to the inventors. The public good fully coincides in both cases with the claims of the individuals. The states cannot separately make effectual provisions for either of the cases, and most of them have anticipated the decision of this point by laws passed at, instance, at the instance of Congress. 2. To execute, exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district not exceeding 10 square miles, as may, by cessation of particular states and the acceptance of Congress, become the seat of government of the United States, and to exercise like authority in over all places purchased by the consent of the legislatures of the states in which the same shall be, for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings the indispensable necessity of complete authority at the seat of government carries its own evidence with it. It is a power exercised by every legislature of the Union, I might say of the world, by virtue of its general supremacy. Without it, not only the public authority might be insulted and its proceedings interrupted with impunity, but a dependence of the members of the general government on the state comprehending the seat of the government for protection in the exercise of their duty, might bring on the national councils an imputation of all and influence, equally dishonorable to the government and dissatisfactory to the other members of the Confederacy. This consideration has the more weight as the gradual accumulation of public improvements at the stationary residence of the government would be both too great a public pledge to be left in the hands of a single state and would create so many obstacles to a removal of the government as still further to abridge its necessary independence. The extent of this federal district is sufficiently circumscribed to satisfy every jealousy of an op opposite nature, and as it is to be appropriated to this use with the consent of the state ceding it, as the state will no doubt provide in the compact for the rights and the consent of the citizens inhabiting it as the inhabitants will find sufficient inducements of interest to become willing parties to the secession, as they will have had their voice in the election of the government, which is to exercise authority over them, as a municipal legislature for local purposes derived from their own suffrages will of course be allowed them, and as the authority of the legislature of the state and of the inhabitants of the ceded part to concur in the cessation will be derived from the whole people of the state in their adoption of the Constitution. Every imaginable objection seems to be obviated. 
the necessity of a like authority over forts, magazines, etc., established by the general government is not less evident. The public money expended on such places and the public property deposited in them requires that they should be exempt from the authority of the particular state. Nor would it be proper for the places on which the security of the entire Union may depend to be in any degree dependent on a particular member of it. All objections and scruples are here also obviated by requiring the concurrence of the states concerned in every such establishment. 3. To declare the punishment of treason, but no attainder of treason shall work corruption of blood or forfeiture except during the life of the person attained. As treason may be committed against the United States, the authority of the United States ought to be enabled to punish it. But, as newfangled and artificial treasons have been the great engines by which violent factions, the natural offsprings of free government, have usually reaped their alternate malignity on each other, the Convention have, with great judgment, opposed a barrier to this particular danger by inserting a constitutional definition of the crime, fixing the proof necessary for conviction of it, and restraining the Congress, even in punishing it, from extending the consequences of guilt beyond the person of its author. 4. To admit new states into the Union, but no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state nor shall any state be formed by the junction of two or more states, or parts of the states, without the consent of the legislatures of the states concerned, as well as of the Congress. In the Articles of Confederation, no provision is found on this important subject. Canada was to be the admitted of right on her joining in the measures of the United States, and the other colonies, by which were evidently met the other British colonies, at the discretion of nine states, the eventual establishment of new states seems to have been overlooked by the compilers of that instrument. We have seen the inconvenience of this omission, and the assumption of power into which Congress had been led by it. With great propriety, therefore, has the new system supplied the defect. The general precaution that no new states will be formed without the concurrence of the federal authority and that of the states concerned is consonant to the principles which ought to govern such transactions. The particular precaution against the erection of new states by the per perition of a state without its consent quiets the jealousy of the larger states, as that of the smaller is quieted by a like precaution against a jurisdiction of states without their consent. 5. To dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States, with a provisio that nothing in the Constitution shall be so construed as to prejudice any claims of the United States, or of any particular state. This is a power of very great importance, and required by considerations similar to those which show the prop propriety of the former. The provisio annexed is proper in itself and was probably rendered absolutely necessary by jealousies and questions concerning the western territory sufficiently known to the public. 6. To guarantee to every state in the Union a republican form of government. To protect each of them against invasion and on application of the legislature or of the executive when the legislature cannot be convened against domestic violence. In a confederacy founded on Republican principles and composed of Republican members, the superintending government ought clearly to possess authority to defend the system against aristocratic or monarchical innovations. The more intimate the nature of such a union may be, the greater interest have the members in the political institutions of each other, and the greater right to insist that the forms of government under the which the compact was entered into should be substantially maintained. But a right implies a remedy, and where else can the remedy be deposited than where it is deposited by the Constitution? Governments of dissimilar principles and forms have been found less adapted to a federal coalition of any sort than those of a kindred nature, 
as the Confederate Republic of Germany, says Montesquieu, consists of free cities and petty states subject to different princes, experience shows us that it is more imperfect than that of Holland and Switzerland. Greece was undone, he adds, as soon as the king of Macedon obtained a seat among the Amphitheons. In the latter case, no doubt, the dis disproportionate force, as well as the monarchical form, of the new confederate had its share of influence on the events. It may possibly be asked what need there could be of such a precaution, and whether it may not become a pretext for altercations in state governments, without the concurrence of the states themselves. These questions admit of ready answers. If the interposition of the general government could not be needed, the provision for such an event will be a harmless superfluity only in the Constitution. But who can say what experiments may be produced by the caprice of particular states, by the ambition of enterprising leaders, or by the intrigues and influence of foreign powers? To the second question, it may be answered that if the general government should interpose by virtue of its constitutional authority, it will be, of course, bound to pursue the authority. But the authority extends no further than a guarantee of a republican form of government, which supposes a pre-existing government of the form which is to be guaranteed. As long, therefore, as the existing republican forms are continued by the states, they are guaranteed by the federal constitution. Whenever the states may choose to su substitute other republican forms, they have the right to do so, and to claim the federal guarantee for the latter. The only restriction imposed upon them is that they shall not exchange Republican for anti-Republican constitutions. A restriction which, it is presumed, will, be, will hardly be considered as a grievance. Boy, are we not there. A protection against evasion is due from every society to the parts composing it. The latitude of the expression here seen, used seems to secure each state, not only against foreign hostility, but against ambitious or vindictive enterprises of its more powerful neighbors. The history, both of ancient and modern confederacy, proves that the weaker members of the Union ought not to be insensible to the policy of this article. Protection against domestic violence is added with equal propriety. It has been remarked that even among the Swiss cantons, which, properly speaking, are not under one government, provision is made for this object, and the history of that league informs us that mutual aid is frequently claimed and afforded, and as well as the most democratic as the other cantons. A recent and well-known event among ourselves has warned us to be prepared for emergencies of a like and nature. At first view, it might seem not to square with the Republican theory to suppose either that a majority have not the right or that the minority will have the force to subvert a government, and consequently that the federal interposition can never be required, but when it would be improper. But theoretic reasoning in this, as in most other cases, must be qualified by the lessons of practice. Why may not illicit combinations for the purposes of the violence, be formed as well by a majority of a state, especially a small state, as by a majority of a county or a district of the same state. And if the authority of the state ought, in the latter case, to project, protect the local magistracy, ought not the federal authority, in the former, to support the state authority? Besides, there are certain parts of the state constitutions which are so interwoven with the federal constitution that a violent blow cannot be given to the one without communicating the wound to the other. <clears throat> Insurrections in a state will rarely induce a federal interposition unless the number concerned in them bear some proportion to the friends of government. It will be much better that the violence in such cases should be repressed by the superintending power than that the majority should be left to maintain their cause by a bloody and obstinate contest. The existence of a right to interpose will generally prevent the necessity of exerting it. Is it true that force and right are necessary on the same side in Republican governments? May not the minor party possess such a superiority of pecuniary resources 
of military talents and experience, or of secret suckers from foreign powers, as will render it superior also in an appeal to the sword. May not a more compact and advantageous position turn the scale on the same side against a superior number so situated as to be less capable of a prompt and collected exertion of its strength. Nothing can be more chimerical than to imagine that in a trial of actual force, victory may be calculated by the rules which prevail in a census of the inhabitants, or which determine the event of an election. May it not happen, in fine, that the minority of citizens may become a majority of persons, by the accession of alien residents of a casual concourse of adventurers, or of those whom the constitution of the state has not admitted to the rights of suffrage. I take no notice of unhappy species of population abounding in some of the states, who, during the calm of regular government, are sunk below the level of men, but who, in the tempestuous scenes of civil violence, may emerge into the human character, and give a superiority of strength to any party with which they may associate themselves. In cases where it may be doubtful on which side justice lies, what better umpires can be desired by two violent factions flying to arms and tearing a state to pieces than the representatives of Confederate states, not heeded by the local flame? To the impartiality of judges, they would unite the affection of friends. Happy would it be if such a remedy for its infirmities could be enjoyed by all free governments, if a project equally effectual could be established for the universal peace of mankind. Should it be asked, what is to be the redress for an insurrection pervading all the states, and comprising a superiority of the entire force? Though not a constitutional right, the answer must be that such a case as it would be without the compass of human remedies, so it is fortunately not within the compass of human probability, and that it is a sufficient recommendation of the federal constitution that it diminishes the risk of a calamity for which no possible constitution can provide a cure. Among the advantages of a confederate republic enumerated by Montague, an important one is that should a popular insurrection happen in one of the states, the others are able to quell it. Should abuses creep into one part, they are reformed by those that remain sound. 7. To consider all debts contracted and engagements entered into before the adoption of this Constitution as being no less valid against the United States under this Constitution than under the Confederation. This can only be considered as a declaratory proposition and may have been inserted, among other reasons, for the satisfaction of the foreign creditors of the United States, who cannot be strangers to the pretended doctrine that a change in the political form of a civil society has the magical effect of dissolving its moral obligations. Among the lesser criticisms which have been exercised on the Constitution, it has been remarked that the validity of engagements ought to have been asserted in favor of the United States, as well as against them. And in the spirit which usually characterizes little critics, the omission has been transformed and magnified into a plot against the national rights. The authors of this discovery may be told, what few others need to be informed of, that as engagements are in their nature reciprocal, an assertion on the their validity on one side necessarily involves a validity on the other side, and that as the article is merely declaratory, the establishment of the principle in one case is sufficient for every case. They may be further told that every constitution must limit its precautions to dangers that are not altogether imaginary, and that no real danger can exist that the government would dare, with or even without this constitutional declaration before it, to remit the debts justly due to the public, on the pretext here condemned. 8. To provide for amendments to be ratified by three-fourths of the states under two exceptions only. That useful alterations will be suggested by experience could not but be foreseen. It was requisite, therefore, that a mode for introducing them should be provided. 
The mode preferred by the convention seems to be stamped with every mark of propriety. It guards equally against that extreme fo faculty, <coughs> facility, which would render the Constitution too mutable, and that extreme difficulty which might perpetuate its discovered faults. It, moreover, equally enables the general and state governments to originate the amendment of errors as they may be pointed out by the experience on one side or on the other. The exception in favor of the equalities of suffrage in the Senate was probably meant as a palladium to the residuary sovereignty of the states, implied and secured by that principle of representation in one branch of the legislature, and was probably insisted on by the states particularly attached to that equality. The other exception must have been admitted on the same considerations which produced the privilege defended by it. 9. The ratification of the conventions of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this constitution between the states, ratifying the same. This article speaks for itself. The express authority of the people alone could give due validity to the constitution. To have required the unanimous ratification of the thirteen states would have subjected the essential interest of the whole to the caprice or corruption of a single member. It would have marked a want of foresight in the convention, which our own experience would have rendered inexcusable. Two questions of a very delicate nature present themselves on this occasion. On what principle of the Confederation, which stands in the solemn form of a compact among the states, can be superseded without the unanimous consent of the parties to it? What relation is to subsist between nine or more states ratifying the Constitution and the remaining few who do not become parties to it? The first question is answered at once by recurring to the absolute necessity of the case, to the great principle of self-preservation, to the transcendent law of nature and of nature's God, which declares that the safety and happiness of society are the objects at which all political institutions aim, and to which all such institutions must be sacrificed. Perhaps, also, an answer may be found without searching beyond the principles of the compact itself. It has been heretofore, heretofore noted among the defects of the Confederation that in many of the states it had received no higher sanction than a mere legislative ratification. The principle of reciprocality seems to require that its obligation on the other states should be reduced to the same standard. A compact between independent sovereigns founded on ordinary acts of legislative authority can pretend no higher validity than a league or treaty between the parties. It is an established doctrine on the subject of treaties that all the objects are mutually conditions of each other, that a breach of any one article is a breach of the whole treaty, and that a breach committed by either of the party absolves the others and authorizes them, if they please, to pronounce the compact violated and void. Should it unhappily be necessary to appeal to these delicate truths for a justification for dispensing within the consent of particular states to a dissolution of the federal pact, will not the complaining parties find a difficult task to answer the multiplied and important infractions with which they may be confronted? The time has been when it was incumbent on us all to veil the ideas which this paragraph exhibits. The scene has now changed, and with it the part which the same motives dictate. The second question is not less delicate, and the flattering prospects of it being merely hypothetical forbids an over-curious discussion of it. It is one of those cases which must be left to provide for itself. In general, it may be observed that although no political relation can subsist between the assenting and dissenting states, yet the moral relations will remain uncancelled. The claims of justice, both on one side and on the other, will be enforced and must be fulfilled. The rights of humanity must, in all cases, be duly and mutually respected, whilst considerations of a common interest and, above all, the remembrance of the endearing scenes which are the past and the anticipation of a speedy triumph over the obstacles of reunion will, it is hoped, not urge in vain moderation on one side, 
and prudence on the other. Publius. And so ends Federalist paper number 43. And this is where we're going to wrap it up because this was one whole section and I like to keep them in sections as much as possible. This was the discussion on the limitations of the federal government. And while the federal government does have extensive powers, they are clearly delineated in the Constitution. We, as a people, have ignored that to our own great detriment. We see right now, as I speak, today is May the 8th, 2024, and there are campus protests, right? Free protest. And these people are not protesting. They are subverting. They are literally against the Constitution. They are literally promoting democracy as opposed to a republic, and that is unacceptable. The, our, our protection is the republic. If we go to democracy, we will secede to tyranny. That is the inevitable fall of that. The communists who are currently protesting could care less about the actual thing that they are protesting. They are merely subverting our Constitution. And our government is in large part restricted from taking care of that situation. It is up to the states and the citizens of the states to remedy that particular situation. That is clearly delineated right here in these papers. The rights of the citizens have, in large part, been given away to various arms of the federal government, but it was never the intention that the federal government be overreaching. Most of the sovereignty was to be retained by the states and, most importantly, by the electorate. We are meant to be largely free Civilization requires taxation. It requires punishments. It requires governments. It requires authorities. It requires that the law be upheld, regardless of who is breaking it, regardless of whether or not you, in particular, consider that law fair. The aggregate is our, our safeguard in these instances. It is the large aggregate of people who will become upset if laws become unjust. And that is our only fallback, is our citizens getting upset enough to handle the things that our government is expressly limited from. They are supposed to prevent an invasion, and yet we have one. It is supposed to limit the scope of wars, and yet we are endlessly tied into them. There are many things that have been clearly delineated as not being powers of the federal government that we have given away to the government. And it is more than time for us as citizens to be responsible and educate ourselves, right? Reading this aloud is educating me and helping to educate you if you are this far along. We're going to do the Constitution. We're going to read all kinds of things. And I know that that is boring for some people. But I believe in energetic investment. I believe that merely by speaking this aloud, I am creating it. And it is easier It is easier to create singly in the positive than in the negative, even though the negative is easier to create. The more people who are doing the positive, which I believe I am doing by reading this aloud, is... Adding the energetic investment to return our union to what it was intended to be. And it never really was, right? This has been an experiment in freedom that is currently ongoing, but that we need to ensure continues. Hopefully it brought a little bit of enlightenment and not too much confusion to a somewhat difficult topic. The, the things discussed in here, you should definitely not just read one time. You should go back and digest this separately from me. If it helps to hear me read it, by all means, play it three or four times. But go back and read it and take your time and go through it and understand exactly where the Constitution delineates the powers of the federal government. It is in these three sections right here where it's told to you. To the crew, thanks for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you are here with me. And I am praying for you every single day. Until next time, I love you. God loves you. You are a perfect whole and complete just the way that you are. And this has been Pitt's Tate. Peace.